Very good evening to all. His Excellency Akira Sugiyama, Ambassador for Japan in Sri Lanka, Mr. Merrick Gunaratna, Project Chairman, Lanka Japan Society, President of Lanka Japan Society, uh, family members of late Dr. Deshamane, Dr. P. R. Anthonis, distinguished invitees, all other members today, those who are assembled here. It is my great pleasure to deliver this Dr. Deshamanya P. R. Anthony's memorial uh, oration because not only he has connected to Japan, but the most importantly, he has been the Chancellor for University of Colombo more than 21 years. When I joined as assistant lecturer in 1990, he was the Chancellor for University of Colombo. I had many occasions uh, in convocations with him as the Chancellor of the Premier University. And the special thing that Dr. Deshamanya Antonis had the prestigious editorship of the, the Ceylon Medical Journal, which is the premier journal in South Asia in terms of medical uh, discipline. And he was the Chancellor for University of Colombo from 1981 to Nine, uh, 2002 as the longest chancellor up to now in the University of Colombo. And top of that, he had time to consult, he had time to operate, time to attend weddings, funerals, meetings, lectures, and scientific sessions, time to do all this often with the space of a day. He served for many uh, occasions, many places, not only one, not only the University of Colombo Medical Faculty. So actually his relations to Japan is very important as Mr. Merrick Gunaratna pointed out, he has awarded a order of sacred treasure from the Japanese government. He served Lanka Japan Friendship Society as a member and its executive committee and vice uh, patron until he passed away in 2009. By considering his contribution to Lanka-Japan relations, it was decided to have title of this oration as the Nexus Japan Powering Prosperity in South Asia. Let me to elaborate on this title today in very important day we are ceremonially celebrating his contribution. Nexus Japan, powering uh, in uh, prosperity in South Asia, as we all are aware that Japan, land of rising sun of the world, was devastated and destroyed by the World War II. Emerged as a developed economy within relatively shorter time period. So, for this reason, many scholars have used the term called economic miracle to explain unprecedented development achievements of Japan during the 1950s and 1960s. As we see in this data, we can see Japan has made a big contribution to the world as fastest grower as well as the stabilized grower, that highest economic growth rate in 1960s, 1970s, 60s to 1973, a 9.7 economic growth rate, which is the world highest economic growth rate. So with this one, what we can understand, there are four major characteristics of economic miracle occurred in Japan. In comparison to other advanced uh, economies, Japan had a miracle, real production growth rate, lowest unemployment rate, and the slightly higher inflation rate. It is possible to identify these four characteristics as, number one, economic growth of Japan was the world highest in 1950s and 1960s. Number two, Japan became the third 
largest economy in the world by 1970s. Number three, Japan became the model for other East Asian economies uh, in several ways. Finally, Japan fulfilled goals of capitalist societies as an alternative to the communist, communist system. So let me to elaborate uh, on these lines before I come into the South Asian uh, scenario. Economic growth of Japan was the world highest. As I uh, mentioned here, if we deco decompose that 1960s, 70s economic growth, from 1956 to 1960, it was recorded 8.8, .8, 61 to uh, 65, 9.2, and 66 to 1970, 11.1, which is the world highest economic growth rate, the production growth rate uh, world highest. So this is one of the most important character of the Japanese economic miracle. According to economic principles, if any country GDP is growing by 1%, it takes 70 years to double their per capita income. So if we see the Japanese per capita income during this period, in 1960, Japan, Japan had only 470 uh, US dollar per capita income. It has increased to 9,000 by 1980 and of course, the highest in 2012, 48,000 per capita income, and 2020, it will be 43,000 43, per capita income. Now you can see from 470 uh, per capita income to reaching 48,000 per capita income. So it is a remarkable achievement uh, of the, uh, the mankind history. And Characteristics of good economic growth, how Japan performed uh, in this way. This economic growth we call in our discipline as sustainable economic growth rate, durable economic growth rate, self-reliance, export-led economic growth rate, and financing through the domestic savings. So economic achievements in Japan was miraculous that through the economic growth rate in Japan. Why and how good economic growth achieved in Japan? According to Takada, 1999, the three major reform policies implemented by the American occupied forces were breakup of Saibatsu, land reform, and labor uh, democratization. I think we can get many lessons these important things even for South Asia. The ability of Japanese people to intimate and apply knowledge and skill learned from the Western countries is the single most important factor for Japan's amazing growth, which was mentioned by the Takada 1999. And import of technologies, improved business conditions, were some of other factors for growth. Also, economic policies and strategies carried out by political characters greatly influenced and accelerated the growth in Japanese economy. The second factor, up to now I have elaborated how economic growth rate and how uh, and why they achieved. The second factor, Japan became the third largest economy in the world by 1970. The size of an economy is dependent on land area, population, amount of income they generate or ability to influence to the world market. Being the fourth largest island nation in the world, Japan has 6,852 islands and the territory of 300, over 370,000 square kilometers. Being an island nation, that the population of Japan, in 1960, it was only 92 million. It had increased up to, by 2010, 128 million. So you can see how the population growth 
uh, in Japan during this period. As a result of this un unprecedented economic growth and growing total production in Japan, the, their GDP, so-called total production in the economy, increased just over 44 billion in 1960 to the 4,872 uh, billion US dollars. That you can see how it has increased. Uh, it is amazing uh, economic growth. And as a result, Japan was seventh country in terms of the production in 1960. And they could reach the second largest economy by 1980 due to their miraculous economic growth and production expansion. So really, Japan became the uh, second largest economy in the world. Support given by Japan to the other part of the world, it is very important. Successive post-war governments in Japan have attempted to uh, improve re relations with Asian countries by using Japan enormous economic superpower. In fact, Japan was the provider of official development assistance, ODA, in the world 1982 through uh, 2001, the world highest uh, ODA provider. Almost all developing countries were benefited from Japan's ODA. Uh, Republic of China, Indonesia in particular benefited from Japanese developmental aid, especially in 1980s and 1990s. The third factor, Japan became the role model for many East Asian countries. Uh, of course, in several ways, not only in one way, the several ways. Number one, after the Second World War, many independent states came as Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, Latin America as the developing nations. New independent nations came out after the Second World War. The main objective of these independent nations were to reduce poverty, grab the economic freedom through models taught by Western capitalist economists or socialists uh, in the uh, either Soviet Union or some other part of the socialist countries. Although various developing countries adopted these uh, two methods, where the capitalist, traditional capitalist method, or the uh, socialist method, that only Japan could came out as a developed nation by mid-1960s. Japan joined the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In other words, it is the richest countries club in the world in 1964. And 1964 is a remarkable year for Japan for many reasons having the Tokyo Olympic and implementing the world fastest uh, train called Shinkansen project uh, in uh, Japan. That as we can see, these are the limited countries we call rich countries club in the world, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or we call OECD member countries. So from the Asia, Japan, the first country which entered as a member of the OECD country in 1964. The Japanese innovations during this period is remarkable. At vehicle per worker, you can compare. In 1955, in automobile industry, vehicle per worker, the GM produced eight vehicles, Ford produced 12 vehicles, Japan could produce only four vehicles per worker. But it has increased up to, by 1964, Japan produced 20 workers, 20 uh, automobiles per worker, while GM produced nine and Ford produced 12. In the highest, you can say 1985, when GM was producing 11 per worker automobile, and Ford was producing 15, Japan was producing four times higher, 60 per worker. So remarkable innovations, you can see how per worker production 
in automobile industry has gone up during this period. And another important thing, in 1960s, many remarkable things happened. The world fastest train, the Shinkansen, was introduced and they continuously improved that, the world fastest uh, 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 rate, where you can see the recent past, they agreed to export their technology to uh, uh, India. Now India is getting uh, Shinkansen from top to down and east to west. So that, that's the project where very recently uh, Japanese Prime Minister and Indian Prime Minister signed. So our neighbor country also benefiting actually this uh, uh, bullet train we call Shinkansen technology which derived by the Japan. So it is also one important type of uh, innovation Japan has uh, improved. And not only that, the world's smallest camera, world tallest building, world longest tunnel from Honshu to Hokkaido. It took them to uh, make 19 years under the sea in 1960s. So there are many remarkable uh, innovations they have done throughout their development history. So I think the South Asia can learn many lessons from Japan than many other countries. Japan was a unique capitalist model. This is another important aspect. Late 1970s due to the following characteristics. Mobilizing resources from agriculture sector to industrial sector achieve the rapid economic growth. Japan also came as an agrarian society like Asian, other Asian countries. So from how we mobilize agricultural resources, farmers, uh, their uh, production, how to mobilize into urban is the, the best uh, uh, knowledge we can have from Japan. The second, the industrialization pattern in Japan had a special name. The Japanese scholar called Akamatsu in 1954 built a new development economic theory, which is called flying geese pattern of industrialization. The flying geese pattern of industrialization means Japan developed like how birds flying on the sky, industries change time to time. Some industries came front, then thereafter, when the, those industries declined, another industries took the leadership. So like that, this pattern observed first time in Japan and it was replicated in the East and Southeast Asian countries, this flying geese pattern of industrialization. Japan obtained loans, another important aspect we can see. Japan obtained loans from the World Bank and IMF in 1950s, paid all these loans back by 1917s and became the biggest donor to the World Bank and IMF by the 1980s. This is a very good example for Sri Lanka about the financial management at country level that we are in crisis today, that we know that how Japan managed the time. Of course, taking loans are not bad. Japan has taken loans to build up Shinkansen and huge amount of infrastructure project. They paid back all and not only that, they became the world largest donor to these multilateral uh, organizations. Another aspect of Japanese development is the foreign direct investment. FDI from Japan played a crucial role in industrial network development in Southeast Asian economies. Now, we all are aware that East Asia has come out as a newly industrializing countries not only just as promoting more industries, but also they have introduced new method of industrialization, which is known today as global value chains, where the production process scattered into various countries that you know in one commodity today, production from many countries are included. In unlike the history, we can see one product is not producing in one country. Part of the production is in one country, 
another part in another country, finally the product is made in another country. So this is called global value chain. So Japan took the leadership of making this global value chain in East Asian context that is remarkable achievement. And apart from that, Japan, as I told you, the ODA, through their ODA, uh, East Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries, uh, they reached the uh, highest uh, achievement uh, because of this uh, ODA uh, grants. Of course, you can see uh, regional uh, areas of the focus of Japan's ODA from 1973 to uh, 2009 that uh, you can see the blue color which are mainly for Southeast Asia. Uh, they received uh, a huge amount of uh, ODA, particularly countries like Indonesia received more than 10% of total Japanese ODA and China also received more than 10% of total Japanese uh, ODA. Less uh, came to the, uh, in, uh, the India or the, uh, the what we are talking about the Southeast Asia, South Asia. As the fourth aspect of Japanese development, fulfill goals of capitalist societies as an alternative to the communism. Traditionally, there has been a capitalism in West which people thought that will serve only for limited amount of population in a country. On the other hand, through the Karl Marx philosophy, the communism all the time propagated that socialism is the best way to come out from these kind of uh, uh, achievements. But Japan proved a totally different story. Within the capitalism, how to promote uh, people's welfare, how to uh, uh, empower the people and how to reduce the income inequality and poverty in the developing country when they reach the developed stage. So several East Asian countries including Republic of China, North Korea and Vietnam, they were the pioneers of socialist countries in Asia. And capitalist countries at that time worried about when East Asian countries became communist, what will happen to the other part of the world also will become a, a communism. So in that case, Japan could prove a different model of capitalism to show that the capitalism is better than socialism. Role of successive governments in Japan, emergence of new entrepreneurial class, export promotion and catching up by larger business led to alternative capitalism in Japan. Three main characteristics of Japanese management practices which gradually emerge through rich culture of Japan and the business practices are widely known as lifelong employment system, seniority uh, based wage system, unique bonus system contributed to have more equitable capitalist society in Japan. Why inequality is low in Japan? This is a remarkable question. Among the advanced countries, the most equitable society is the Japan. In terms of Gini coefficient or any measure of income inequality, ordinary people better off in Japan rather any socialist or any capitalist economy. Uh, the leading uh, driver of increase uh, inequality in the developed world is accumulation of wealth by those who are already wealthy, driven by rate of return on capital that consistently exceeds the rate of uh, GDP growth. Japan has lower levels of inequality than almost every other developed country. Indeed, though it has long been industrial powerhouse, Japan is frequently called the world's most successful communist country. Japan has a high income tax rate for rich people exceeding 45% and in inheritance tax rate recently 
increase up to 55% for the richest class. This makes it difficult to accumulate capital over generations. Country like Sri Lanka, people are dreaming to accumulate wealth for their generations. This is a very good example in Japan that 55% of tax should pay by the rich people in Japan. So it is, the, it is one of the most important equitable measure in a society unlike the Sri Lanka and the other Asian countries. Every good thing must come to an end. Economic progress occurred in Japan was ended by early 1990s. Economic growth in Japan decelerated as 4.4% from 71 to uh, 80, 4.2% from 81 to 90, and less than 2%. Recent economic progress of Japan can be understood with the help of, uh, again, another set of data. That, as we know, uh, in recent past, the economic growth rate of Japan has decelerated as from 1% one, one or less than 1%, but remaining important thing is the, the highest GDP per capita level, which is uh, still uh, over uh, 40,000 US dollars. Government debt has increased, the inflation rate is uh, moderate or very low in Japan, and there is a significant uh, uh, positive growth in the uh, international trade balance. The unemployment rate is remarkable, less than 3%, which is normally called as natural rate of unemployment in an advanced country. By understanding this Japanese uh, evolution, let's think about what is South Asia, how we get the experience from South Asia. Economic progress of South Asia and Japan. South Asia is about the same size as the Europe, but has population that is twice, twice as larger. There are eight countries in South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. The region is in a geographically key position because of its many land area land sea uh, linking to sea area and Middle East and Central Asia can be easily linked through the, uh, our location. I think the South Asian countries now only starting to capitalize their location. We have not capitalized our location as a country. Another important character of the South Asia is diversity. Vast diversity in all the countries with respect to ethnic groups, culture, languages, and all other area we can see we are diverse region than any other region in the world. Most of these countries were agrarian before the colonization of Western countries for more than four centuries from 1500 onward and obtained independence from United Kingdom 1940s and early 1950s. South Asia and Sri Lanka in 1950s. These countries were ranked as underdeveloped countries in 1950s. That we know the characteristics of South Asia in 1950s were large population, high population growth rate, larger families, low productivity, low savings, low investment, income and living standards. So therefore, the South Asia, particularly in Sri Lanka, there were 6.6 .6 million population when we got independence in 1948. Today we have 21 million population. Over three times of our population has increased during the last 70 years. And when we obtained independence, we had 150 per capita income US dollar income and trade surplus we had. We were exporting tea rubber coconut, but we were importing less amount of uh, essential foods. Modern transportation methods were in Sri Lanka due to the, uh, the our plantation sector. 
Many scholars thought that Sri Lanka would enter into a developed world, particularly like Japan, because of our initial conditions were good. But economic progress of Japan is remarkable. Unfortunately, it did not happen in uh, South Asia. That because there were a lot of reasons for that, uh, the South Asian development, you can say, in terms of uh, US dollar per capita income, uh, that Japanese growth was remarkable uh, when we compare with the, the Sri Lankan uh, achievements. Therefore, that I think the South Asia has more longer way to go with this type of development. So, however, growth achievements of India, Bangladesh and Pakistan is remarkable at this moment. You know, during last three years, the South Asia was the most dynamic region in the world. The last year, India grew by 7.2%, which is the world highest economic growth rate. And again, the South Asia is the forerunner of the economic growth in the world now. The most mobilizing region is the South Asia. So, unlike the earlier assumption, I hope that the South Asia will reach a very good position uh, in future. We can see the India, of course, uh, in terms of economic growth and many uh, era that we will reach uh, a good position, but there are a lot of issues we need to discuss about that. When we talk about the uh, South Asia, total reserves over external debt. Not only the, their internal characteristics, the external debt also important uh, in the South Asia. We can see the countries which they have to pay huge amount of external debt. I think I discussed about the Japan's internal debt. The Japanese government also has a huge amount of debt. But the difference between Japan and Sri Lanka is that we have largest proportion of debt as external debts rather than, rather than the internal debts. So relationship with uh, Japan and the South Asia. Traditionally, Japan has been helping all South Asian countries for infrastructure development, poverty reduction, human capital development, health sector development, rural uh, livelihood development, ethnic and social harmony through its official development assistance. As uh, Dr. Deshamanya, uh, PR Antonis uh, could play a crucial role in the health sector connections between Japan and Sri Lanka, Japan has played a crucial role in this area in the South Asia. But unfortunately, we could not enter into ties with uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, Japanese industrial achievements, or link with the Japanese uh, business organizations, and we could not enter into global value chain streams which came into uh, Southeast Asia uh, as the main way of development. Many projects have been implemented through emphasis in South Asian countries, JICA, JASTICA, JETRO, a significant amount of funds have been dis dispersed, number of projects have been implemented, and number of Japanese volunteers have been sent uh, to uh, these uh, South Asian countries since early 1970s or 1960s. Japan's bilateral official development assistance and net disbursements to South Asia, you can see here, the majority has gone to India and Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal because of the larger populations and the larger share of their poverty uh, because that the Japan played a very important role. There are three kinds of relationships we have to analyze in this context. First one, Japan and East Asia relationship, Japan and South Asia, South Asia relationship, and Japan and Southeast Asia relationship. Actually, Japan and East Asia or Japan and Southeast Asia relations were based on trade, based on technology transfer, based on, uh, of course, uh, most important economic ties. But up to now, the Japan and South Asia relations were mainly limited to through the ODA 
and development assistance because of the lack of leadership, uh, lack of many preparations. The project preparations uh, is very uh, lack in the, uh, the South Asian countries, particularly when it comes to procurements, when it, when it comes to project proposals, that I don't think the South Asia uh, is competitive with the East Asia or Southeast Asian context. Uh, given my time is limited, I will little bit expedite. So the important things in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia uh, angle, we need to concern. We know that particularly all the South Asian economies, we had a dream, still there is a dream, I think. This has made from our culture or this has made from our education system that still we believe a big amount of foreign investment will come to our countries and they will provide uh, employment opportunities, they will, they will make the industrialize the country, something like their dreams. I don't think that we will reach that dream ever. So the best example we can get from the Japan, we have to think about our own strength, what we can do, how we uh, try to develop by ourselves. This is very important because the Japanese development pattern tell us don't wait until others come in and play role in your country. So this is one of the important things. Still some Sri Lankan politicians still believe that the foreign investors will come here, invest and, invest and give the job opportunities, industrialize the country while we are still embarking power cut every day. Do you believe with a power cut foreigners will come to this country? This is serious situation. This is, uh, I think we need to consider that. Going into a final summary, South Asia has traditionally been regarded as large, largest home for poor, conflict prone region, the nuclear flashpoint. While most South Asian countries now have democratically elected governments, Sri Lanka could eliminate most brutal terrorists from our land. All South Asian countries have come to understand that their earlier restrictive economic strategies will not be in tune with the changing realities of globalization process. As I suggested, the global value chain, we need to get into that. It may reasonably assume that Japan's foreign policy radar will orient itself towards the building the cohesive strategic ties with South Asia. This is because strategic economic partnership between Japan and South Asia has many potential in line with global treats and challenges. Uh, environment and sustainable development, energy, terrorism and UN reform. Therefore, Nexus Japan is one of the most effective ways of powering prosperity in South Asia. In this context, not only deep diplomatic, official, institutional relationships, but also expansion of private and individual connections are essential in between Japan and Sri Lanka and Japan and South Asia. In this regard, significant number of Japan-related associations have established in South Asian countries during the past few decades. Among them, uh, Japanese graduate alumni associations, we have all these eight countries and we call SAFJWA, that is the, uh, the umbrella uh, association in South Asia, that is the Japanese graduate alumni association of South Asia. And institution based uh, alumni associations like JASTICA, JICA, professional associations, cultural associations, sports related associations, trade related associations, state-led associations, non-governmental organizations initiated uh, by various associations, solidarity and welfare associations among Japanese people in South Asian countries are well functioning. So this is one of the important ties we need to think about. Through these various associations, language, culture and unique attitudes of 
Japanese people are linking to South Asia. Networking among these associations is very important for strengthening mutual ties. Access to resources, access to market, access to technology flows, cost reduction, productivity improvement, business expansion, and generate stability in financial sector in South Asia as well as in Japan. As I pointed out, there are many Japan-related associations in the South Asia. I think Lanka Japan a Friendship Association is one, and Sri Lanka Japanese Graduate Alumni Association, where I am the current president, and Mr. Mary Gunaratna was president earlier. And there are many Japan-related associations in Sri Lanka and South Asia. We have to link these associations, make, make kind of a network to connect these two countries, Japan and South Asia. The strengthening of network among Japan-related associations is South Asia countries, South Asian countries is beneficial for both host country and the home countries. The role, of, the role played by the De, doc, Deshamanya, Dr. P. R. Antonis, to tie up Japan and Sri Lanka had been significant and we all have to carry out his will, wish and activities furthermore. May he attain Nibbana. Thank you very much for listening to me, particularly His Excellency uh, Akira Sugiyama, Ambassador for Japan, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Mr. Mary Gunaratna, Project Chairman, Lanka Japan Friendship Society, and all members who are here today, and all other distinguished invitees. Thank you very much for listening to us. And of course, as the President of Jagas, I also all the time emphasize we need to have this link. We have to improve the linkages among these associations for the betterment of Sri Lanka and Japan relations. Thank you very much.